Right, let's get this show on the road. Well, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming along. On Friday nights are always a tough trade-off between Tin Roof and Ralph Valley Sport and Health for a nutrition lecture, and I don't always win. So <laughs> it's still very good to, to have you here. And I think it's a really important um, subject material that I've been asked to do a number of times. Last year, we concentrated uh, in all the lecture series very much on low carbohydrate nutrition related to weight, weight management mostly in, in the adult context, and we were talking about cholesterol and heart disease, which was all really referencing the adult population. So the question has come up many times, well, what about our children? Is there a role and a place for this, what people perceive to be new science, but it's not really new science, it's old science, of low carbohydrate nutrition or lower carbohydrate eating for, for kids? And is it healthy? So I'm going to try and answer that this evening in, in a relatively short period of time and certainly ask as many questions as you like afterwards if I don't address the particular issues that you have come here to hear. Um, and let's, let's see what we can answer and what we can't. And try and separate some of the myths from what we perceive to be truths with some evidence behind them. But to, to answer the question that is on the screen, low carb for kids healthy or not, I think we have to address this particular question first. And that is, is a high carbohydrate diet healthy or not for children? Because ultimately that's currently what most of our children are actually eating to varying degrees. And the reason for that is that that's what world public nutrition authorities are telling us to feed ourselves and our children. So if you look at the so-called wellness plate, and you take one, two, three out of those four blocks on the main plate, you basically have carbohydrate-type foods occupying almost three-quarters of that plate. So the current food guidelines, and they've just been republished now for 2015 to 2020, but haven't really changed very much since they published them in 1980, which came from the research that was uh, presented to the Americans in 1977, who basically put all of us on what constitutes a high-carbohydrate, low-fat, restricting saturated fat in the diet, because that has been construed to be healthy, healthy for our hearts, healthy for our bodies. If you look at the base of the food pyramid, you don't really have to worry about what's in there. Effectively, it's been telling us that 60% of the calories in our diet should come from carbohydrates, and the rest from limited fats and protein. So, people are obsessed with eating food that is advertised and marketed to be low fat or no fat that appears to be consistent with the traditional guidelines but I just point out in this example on the screen of low-fat granola, you'll notice that the significant difference between granola and low-fat granola happens to be in how much sugar and carbohydrate is in it. So the lesson here is that when foods are fat-reduced, most of the time that will reduce texture, taste, and energy. And in order to replace that, the food industry must put sugar into those foods. So when you see healthy and in inverted commas low-fat foods, by and large they have sugar added to them to restore taste and to restore energy. Okay, and I'm not sure that given what I'm going to show you, that's a particularly good thing. So when we look at the spectrum of carbohydrates, carbohydrate type foods, we're obviously talking about the cereals and breads, flour-based products, starchy vegetables like potatoes, other starches like rice, all the confectionery, fruits and vegetables are also carbohydrates, don't forget that. And the vast array of processed cereal and other foods. These are all carbs, in case we're wondering what we're talking about. And I'm going to use the word carbs, because carbohydrate gets a bit long by a quarter to seven, or half by six. If we really have a, an insight into the modern world for our children there is no doubt that they are drowning in carbohydrate and very much in refined, processed, ultra-sweet, sugary carbohydrates. Most children would see that as fantasy land. And most of us would see as that's a good way to reward screaming, crying, tired children 
to cheer them up temporarily so that they're nice to us. And so our children in the modern era where the food industry have capitalized and exploited the food guidelines that say eat mostly carbohydrates to mean eat lots of sugar, since it happens to be a carbohydrate and a constituent of all carbohydrates. And so our children are getting their nutrition advice from Ronald McDonald, which is just wonderful, and all sorts of other really interesting characters that appeal and directly market to children that this is good, exciting stuff for you to eat. So if we look at world sugar consumption and we concentrate on the exponential curve in the last hundred years or so, it's a dramatic increase worldwide compared to what our forefathers were eating just a hundred years ago. It's quite interesting to the right of the slide to notice that protein intake worldwide has hardly changed. And in fact, in most first world countries, fat intake consistent with the food guidelines, has actually gone down by about 11 to 15%. So we certainly can't blame the obesity epidemic that you keep reading about in America and other countries on fat intake. Because fat intake has gone down. So it can't be that. It must be something else. Maybe there's a clue in this chart. So I want to just have a quick sugar quiz. Very quick. The losers do a thousand press-ups. Right, so a couple of quick questions. Some of you have seen these before. But just to register with you the sugar quantities that occur in things that our children uh, take in regularly, like a simple 330 ml can, fizzy drink can. Since this is going on YouTube, I'm cautious to be sued by the manufacturers. However, this is a Coca-Cola. In that 330 ml can, how many... Teaspoons of sugar do you think might be in there? Don't add up the cubes. Okay? Be honest. Okay. Mr. Calderwood, very quick as a headmaster, added up the cubes in a blink of an eye. All right. So the answer is, yeah, basically about 10 teaspoons of sugar in one little can. All right. It's an enormous amount of sugar as we're going to see. And certainly when you go into the first world, these one and two liter quantity Coca-Colas are not... Uh, uh, uncommon. In fact, in most fast food outlets, and certainly when I was last in the States, you got one of these for free with your pizza. And because it was for free, you definitely had to drink the whole thing. You were not going to leave it, were you? Okay, so that sort of about 28 to 30 teaspoons of sugar in there really goes down well of an evening after dinner. There's enormous quantities of sugar. So the default position for a while was that, well, if they're soft drinks and we're starting to understand that maybe those are unhealthy, we'll default to healthy fruit juice. So the second quiz question this evening is how many teaspoons of sugar do you think are in that healthy bottle of orange juice? You see a number? Yeah, spot on. Twelve teaspoons of sugar in that healthy bottle of orange juice. And it's not a surprise uh, because I'm going to show you who makes Minute Maid. Any ideas who manufacture Minute Maid? It happens to be a product of Coca-Cola. Yeah, well done. Okay, so fall over with surprise. Now, why is this a problem? And why is this related to the problems of modern uh, disease in our world today? It is because we now understand that many people have in their genetics a susceptibility to becoming intolerant to carbohydrates. This intolerance is in your genes and it can switch on at any age. It may switch on in childhood. It may switch on in early adult, adulthood or late adulthood. But if you have these genetic predispositions, they are very likely to trigger and switch on. And current estimates are that between 65 and 75 percent of people carry the genetics to become carbohydrate intolerant, meaning that at some point in time in their life, eating lots of carbohydrates, especially refined ones, are going to have negative effects on their metabolism and on their health. So we know it's in the genes. If it's there, it's there. We know that the effects of carbohydrate intolerance can start 20 years before you manifestly start measuring what we in medicine would start talking about worrying diseases like obesity and diabetes and hypertension. 20 years.
before. In America, they are very much aware of the fact that they're examining children who are overweight in their childhood years and showing they have all the metabolic markers of carbohydrate intolerance. They haven't become diabetic. They haven't become morbidly obese. They don't have hypertension, but they are going to be. They are going to be. They're showing in childhood the markers of this intolerance at 10 years old and 12 years old. So just go 20 years from there, and we know where the end result is likely to be. And for people, children or otherwise, who are carbohydrate intolerant, the reality of the matter is that carbohydrates in large quantity and especially refined are a danger to their health. That's the message we have to understand. And what did I say about population statistics? Up to 75% of people are likely to have these genetics. So it's not a surprise that there are lots and lots of people who look like this large gentleman on the scale in the world today. Because we are seeing the manifest results of the food guidelines 35 years later. So I wanted to show you what is very complex, but I'm going to try and put it into one slide and simplify it. In people who are carbohydrate intolerant, who eat lots of refined carbohydrates and have high levels of sugar floating around in their bloodstream frequently, daily, monthly, and yearly, have high levels of the hormone insulin, which is the hormone that controls sugar in your body, circulating in their bodies, after a while, they'll become what we call insulin resistant, which means the cells of the muscles and the liver don't want to accept any more sugar. They've had enough, so they don't want to listen to insulin anymore. That's called insulin resistance. Insulin resistance sets up a situation where the body converts more and more of the sugar directly to fat, and we start storing it initially in our liver, where we get what we call a fatty liver, and once we have a fatty liver, we are well on our way to metabolic illness or disorder of the body. We are metabolically ill, either in childhood or in adulthood. And once we become metabolically ill, and we're storing more and more of this fat now in the body, especially in the tummy area, which is a very nice receptacle for the storage of fat. It's highly expandable. It fits a lot of quantity then we will start to see the onset of the diseases of lifestyle that are associated with metabolic disorder. Obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and increasing cancer rates. So this we know. This slide sums up a whole textbook of abnormal metabolism related to what we eat. Not how much we eat, what we eat. That's the mistake of the last... 40 years, it's not about how much we eat, it's what we eat. If what we eat increases our sugar levels frequently, persistently, this cycle starts and keeps rotating in people with that intolerance. I shouldn't complain about the rain in a drought, should I? I won't. So this explains why, if we look at the progress of humanity... For two and a half million years, we seem to maintain pretty athletic physiques without large... Uh, incidences of obesity in populations because we were hunter-gathering. Then we gathered in communities and started to grow things in, out of the ground. And then we gathered around those in communities and we developed, <clears throat> that was for 12,000 years, we learned how to grow things. Then we learned how to take the things that we grow in the ground, we, could, we took the wheat out of the ground and we processed it. We could put it into a box. And we could call it Weetabix. Okay? And bread. But actually, the greatest change in human shape from a health point of view has been in the last 35 years. And that basically is synonymous with humans eating a high-carbohydrate diet consistent with the food guidelines that the Americans told us we should be eating and everybody's followed them. So if we look at the impact on the young, we have to consider the global impact of a high-carbohydrate diet on young people. This is a very good impression of the effects of soft drinks on young people. That picture tells a story. I believe there are three dimensions to looking at this global impact. Before the child is born, in the very developmental stage, 
at any current age of childhood, so it could be baby, toddler, teenager, and then the future, the child grows into adulthood. So in the developmental stage, what do we know about what happens when mum eats a high refined carbohydrate diet with lots of sugar and gains a lot of weight in pregnancy? We know that overweight pregnant women end up with heavy babies. Also, all that sugar going into the mother's system primes the baby system to be over-responsive with insulin when they are born. So in response to eating carbohydrates when they're born, that baby is already over-responding with insulin. It's already developing early carbohydrate intolerance because they have been primed and programmed in the uterus. So it starts way back there. We know that women who are very overweight in pregnancy not only have babies that are very heavy, but babies who will progress to type 2 diabetes as adults at two to three times the rate of babies born to normal weight women. It predicts metabolic disease. So what do we do after they're born? Well, sometimes breastfeeding is a snag. Sometimes it's convenient to start looking at infant formulas. Now just to give you an example, I had a look at this Similac Isimil Advance and looked at the constituents. And you'll see the contrast when we talk about breastfeeding uh, in a while. But amongst the constituents in Similac Isimil Advance, hopefully I won't get sued on YouTube, it consists effectively, it has 50, it's 50% corn syrup and 10% sucrose or sugar. So effectively, that infant feeding formula is 60% sugar. It's glorious. You only have to be that age and you've already started on a 60% sugar diet. That cannot be correct. And I'll tell you what, when you look at babies who are predominantly fed on infant formula, there are lots of roles. We were at a christening just the other day, and it was very interesting to watch a baby on one lap and a baby on the next lap. And the baby on the one lap was fully breastfed. They were the same age. I think they were two weeks apart. And the baby on the other lap, for uh, reasons that the mum had a, had a snag breastfeeding at all, was totally formula-fed. And that formula-fed baby was double the size of that breastfed infant. It was amazing to see. No, I tried to take them, but I didn't, I didn't want to get sued. So when we progress from the developmental stage and we go into the child, in, in childhood post-baby, then we start seeing really mad children demanding the carbohydrates. And just to give you some idea, these are some UK figures recently published, that in the UK, four to ten-year-olds are now consuming five and a half thousand teaspoons of sugar per year, which amounts to about 15 teaspoons of sugar per day, which if you really want to keep quantifying is about 22 kilograms per year. And to give you some comparison, on the curve I showed you on world sugar consumption, 100 years ago, our great-great-great-grandparents were eating less than 4 kilograms a year. Okay, now 4-year-olds are eating 22. U.S. teenagers, it is estimated, consume between 28 and 34 teaspoons of sugar a day. You think that's a lot. Well, what are two Coca-Colas? Just two soft drinks is 21 teaspoons done. One hit. And the average soft drink intake of American teenagers is two to three a day. In soft drinks alone. They haven't started with cornflakes, pasta, or the sugar that they put in their tea and coffee. Just the soft drinks. The WHO recently published sugar limit guidelines for world health and say that children should consume less than three teaspoons a day. So you have some contrast there. Then certainly not in line with even what the WHO is talking about with respect to sugar consumption. So when you see this excessive sugar consumption, what comes along with it? What do we get to see? We see the early signs of excessive sugar consumption are basically dental cavities, holes in the teeth. All right? That is the early sign that children are consuming too much sugar. And to give you some interesting examples, I did a study in rural Nigeria where the sugar consumption was very, very low to show that the rate of dental caries was less than 2% of children. 
In America, by the age of 10, 95% of children have had at least two. Okay. In the UK, the figures are somewhere along the line that under 10-year-olds, one in three have got dental caries. Okay. And they are a direct result of sugar consumption. Those are the early signs. Childhood obesity rates in the U.S. have tripled since 1980. Tripled. Crazy children diagnosed with ADHD. Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder. It is estimated that up to 75% of ADHD children simply suffer from hyperactivity from excessive sugar consumption. And the true ADHD probably constitutes less than 25% of the hyperactive diagnosis in children. It's about what they eat. Bad skin in teenagehood is often aggravated dramatically by high sugar intake. And epilepsy, childhood epilepsy, gets much worse when kids eat lots of sugar. Okay, so these are the presentation of childhood problems related to nutrition. And what do we see going forward into the future? These children with very high sugar intakes who are carbohydrate intolerant, we start to see large numbers of adult obese people. In America, adult obesity has tripled since 1980. Obesity is now considered an epidemic along with the rising levels of diabetes in the world. These are epidemics. They far outweigh any infectious disease. It's it kind of almost amusing to see the, the media hype about Zika virus. In Zimbabwe, I said we've got a Zika virus. Okay? About Zika virus and other things, HIV. Very prevalent problems, but pale into insignificance if you look at the numbers of people with obesity and diabetes in the world. These are the real epidemics that we face. So diabetes is there. Breast cancer rates dramatically rising along with all of the endocrine cancers. We know that high carbohydrate diets are strongly associated with the prevalence and the rise in the numbers of breast cancer, prostate cancer, um, bowel cancer, what we call the endocrine hormone-sensitive cancers. Alzheimer's disease directly connected to sugar intake, carbohydrate intake. Hypertension and all other forms of heart disease like coronary artery disease are related to sugar intake. So a couple of quick facts about carbs just so that we remember. Remember that all sugars are carbohydrates. All carbohydrates are made of sugars. All carbohydrates end up as sugars in the body. So any carbohydrate, whether it be a potato or a grain of rice or a bit of Weetabix from the cereal box, will end up as sugar. Some carbohydrates are digested slowly and some rapidly, depending on their fibrous content. Carbohydrates actually, as an energy supply for the body, a fuel supply, are actually very poor. And there's no way on earth humans would have evolved for two and a half million years if we had relied on carbohydrates as the principal source of energy, because it's a very poor source of energy. It's only got four calories per gram in carbohydrates. And the, the analogy here is if we filled up our cars with carbohydrates for fuel and we expected to get to Bulawayo, we'd get to Chugutu and have to refill. Very poor quality fuel. Okay? Doesn't take us very far before we have to refill, become hungry, and get some more in the tank. The other point about sugar is that there's absolutely no nutrient content whatsoever. So there really is very little reason for having sugar in the diet. In fact, there is no reason. We don't need it for fuel, and it doesn't give us anything as far as nutrients are concerned. And certainly our children don't need it either. I talked about foods that increase uh, blood sugar rapidly or slowly. So everything on the chart here in red, which are flours and breads and sugars and cereals and pasta and white rice, potatoes and some fruits, these raise blood sugar very quickly and the dietitians classify these as highly glycemic or high glycemic index foods, high GI, they use the term GI, which is a measure of how quickly a food raises one's blood sugar. 
foods on the other on the right hand side and the yellow are foods that will may have an effect on blood sugar, but it's much less and it's much slower. And obviously if a food is producing a big pump in blood sugar, it's also producing a corresponding big pump in insulin. If you remember back to the metabolic diagram. So that's not good. So foods like these are not particularly good for the insulin level in the body. And I told you that whole cycle is about what sugar is going to do to insulin, what insulin is going to do to fat storage, and what fat storage is going to do to your risk or your child's risk of disease. One of the common things that we have in, in, in medicine and often to the GPs is that they, people like to give themselves a label, and children are often diagnosed as hypoglycemic. Have you heard that? This child is hypoglycemic, which I'm still trying to figure out what kind of disease that is because it doesn't appear in any textbook on disease. There is no such disease as hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia simply, simply indicates a child who is on a roller coaster of sugar intake through the day, having some nice sugary white bread type carbohydrates and having a sugar high with an insulin high, and then the sugar drops dramatically. That's hypoglycemia when your blood sugar drops, and they go from being absolutely mad and crazy and hyperactive to falling asleep at school. All right, so hypoglycemia is simply a physiological response to highly refined sugar and carbohydrate intake and the effects of that. It's not a disease. It indicates that that child is poorly nourished. They are eating rubbish. They have unsustainable fuel supplies from their diet. So if your child's been diagnosed with hypoglycemia, please go, just go and talk to your GP and say, what kind of disease is that? Okay? I think the GPs are very good because they're going to follow up that, that statement with a conversation about nutrition, I hope. So, if I've planted the one fact in your minds that basically sugar, refined carbohydrates are not the healthiest things for people to rely on as the majority of calories in their diet, there are also an element of fats that are unhealthy in the modern diet, especially the hydrogenated vegetable oils. These are the ones that are used for frying fast food. Uh, margarine is a good example of a hydrogenated vegetable oil, these are all very dangerous for health for a variety of reasons. They are highly inflammatory. They have high amounts of omega-6 fatty acids, and your body's got a very critical balance between these essential fatty acids. You've heard of the omega-3s, which are common in fatty fish. The omega-6s are common in grain-fed uh, animals, in grains, and in vegetable oils, and it's not healthy to have a high intake of omega-6 fatty acids versus a low intake of omega-3s. Okay? So these oils are not particularly good because they fill you up with these sixes. They are inflammatory. And the other thing about vegetable oils is that when you fry them to the point where they smoke, they produce some really nasty chemicals called aldehydes, which are really nasty to your arteries that cause inflammatory arterial disease and are uh, under suspicion for cancer-inducing or cancer-worsening properties. Okay, so these are not good fats and oils to have in large quantities. Unfortunately, they are cheap, so we use them as our carbohydrates. So, to return to the point of tonight, all right? Low carbohydrate for children, healthy or not. Well, I hope that I've painted a picture that the modern diet, which is the contra to this, can hardly be considered healthy. So this has to be a viable alternative. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about a lower carbohydrate, full name, higher, healthier fat intake type of nutrition program is that we start them young. And we do start them young if they're breastfed because Although the nutritionists of the world and the public health authorities would like to tell us how bad saturated fat is for our health, the reality is breast milk is 54% fat, almost all of which is saturated. So there you are, the good Lord gave us this wonderful commodity, which is the healthiest thing that newborn infants can eat on this planet, and it happens to be mostly saturated fat. How would we have evolved such a dangerous substance if this was so bad for us? It makes no 
sense and has no evidence to support such a statement in science. It's 38% carbon, 8% protein. So we start anyway as nature intended on a high-fat, low-carbohydrate program. I think at this point in time I want to make very clear what we mean by low carbohydrate because a little bit like sin, it means different things to different people. All right, so I want you to understand what I mean and what a good low carbohydrate dietitian will mean when they talk about this. There are three broadly accepted categories of carbohydrate restriction for nutrition. The first is where carbohydrate is cut back from where people are eating consistent with the guidelines that we talked about earlier, they're probably eating anything from 300 to 500 grams of carbohydrate a day. As a high, highly, trained, high, highly trained or in high training triathlete, I used to eat 500 grams of carbohydrate a day. So if you cut that back to between 130 and 200 grams of carbohydrate, we talk about that as a reduced carbohydrate diet. And that is really the zone that we're talking about for children's health. We're not talking about putting them on some radical, mega-restricted carbohydrate diet, which we go down the, the chart to look at low-carbohydrate diets being less than 130, and very low-carbohydrate diets, which we also call ketogenic, which are less than 30 grams a day. These very low-carb ketogenic diets we use clinically as nutrition programs for very obese children and adults, and for type 2 diabetics, and people who are recovering from cancer and other diseases which we can tie to carbohydrate and sugar. But they're not what we are advocating for health, just general health for healthy kids of healthy weight. But we certainly advocate that we should be reducing the carbohydrate in their diet. So if we talk about healthy nutrition, reducing the carbs, it really comes down to this overview of the program. We should be cutting out all sugar. It is not an essential nutrient. It has no nutrients. We do not need it for energy. And we must be looking at the foods that we buy in the supermarkets to look for added sugar. Because there's lots of added sugar. In America, they did a survey of 600,000 products available in supermarkets. 80% of those products had sugar added to them. And many of them were products that you wouldn't even think. Even this week, I was in one of our supermarkets and I was buying a tin of creamed mushrooms. And just for interest, because I do this all the time, I turned that tin to look at the contents. And what did I find in this tin of creamed mushrooms? But a whole bunch of sugar. And I went, what on earth did they do that for? Because that's what the food industry does. Because sugar is highly addictive, it makes things taste nice, and it makes you come back for more. Cutting out refined carbohydrates, so not just sugar, but refined carbohydrates. Wheat out of the ground becoming bread and Weetabix. Wheat's a good example because we shouldn't be eating that anyway. So we know there are a whole host of negative health effects of high wheat intakes, not just gluten intolerance. Wheat, and especially modern wheat, which has been genetically modified over many, many years, but mostly in the last 20, bears no resemblance to the grass that our ancestors started to harvest 12,000 years ago. Wheat was just grass. Now it's a highly modified plant with all sorts of bad things in it. And it gets even worse when you take wheat and make it into bread, which is now highly refined wheat, which becomes sugar in a heartbeat. Here's a good statistic for you. If you eat two slices of whole wheat bread, which somehow carry some mystique of health, they will raise your blood sugar faster and to a higher level than six teaspoons of sugar. Two slices of whole wheat bread will produce a bigger spike in blood sugar than six teaspoons of sugar. Okay? We need to eat, if we're going to eat grains, and, and I'm very happy that healthy weight children eat grains, but they should be non-gluten grains. So the gluten grains, wheat, barley, rye, non-gluten grains, quinoa, uh, amaranth, brown rice, wild rice, Okay? 
These are not as prolifically bad for blood sugar and insulin as gluten grains, refined carbs, or sugar. Fruits and vegetables are important. They're actually most important for their fiber content and less important for their vitamins and minerals, which might surprise you. I'll say something about that now. They are most important for their fiber content. Healthy fats. I'm going to have a look at that. What do we mean by healthy fats? Children are not deprived of their sweets and treats on a lower carbohydrate nutrition program. There is a whole world, the whole universe of baking using low carbohydrate ingredients, using non wheat flour, using almond flour, coconut flour, using sweeteners like xylitol, erythritol, or stevia to sweeten baked products instead of sugar. It's a whole new world. The fundamental message for children is that we need to return to eating real food. If you want to sum it up, I talk a lot about low carbohydrate and high fat, but the reality we're saying, we need to eat food as it comes from nature and it's put on the shelf, not converted into something with a multiple ingredient list on the side of a box or a can. That's really the take-home message. And World Nutrition needs to move to that to solve the epidemics of lifestyle diseases that we are facing today and which are going to get dramatically worse. Diabetes is projected to more than double by the year 2025 and reduce the American Health Service and the National Health Service in the UK to nothing. They will bankrupt both of those countries. Just the disease of diabetes type 2 by 2025, which used to sound long away, but no longer appears to be that far away. So they worry about international conflict and the effect of ISIS and migration, but the reality is right on their doorsteps and our doorsteps and South Africa's doorsteps is a diabetes epidemic that's about to smash us. So we need to return to eating real food. The message is that our world is alive with, figure, with sugar. Sugar, as I mentioned, is added to everything. And this slide comes from my book, which is coming out next month. In fact, which month are we in? This month. This is sugar by any other name. is still sugar, and I apologize for the font, but I'm not asking you to read it. These are the names used to disguise sugar when it's added to food. So many times you'll read the side of a, of a, of a processed food. It won't say sugar. It might say cane crystals, or diastatic malt, or refiner's syrup, it is all synonyms for sugar. And you've got to be aware of this. This is how the food industry gets away with it. Now, countries are starting to legislate that if there's sucrose in there, you've got to put sucrose. It's, it's coming, and when it does come, it'll make them more regulated, and us, hopefully, a little bit less deceived. So what do we mean by healthy fats? Well, by and large, we talk about the fats that for years people said we shouldn't eat. All the animal fats, the saturated dominant fats. But actually, interestingly enough, that porterhouse steak there with a nice big chunk of fat on it shouldn't be called a saturated fat. Is your impression that meat is saturated fat? That's what we were told we shouldn't eat. It's going to clog our arteries. It's going to give our children heart disease when they're older. Well, actually, if you go and look at the fat content of that porterhouse steak with this nice big bit of fat there, it's mostly monounsaturated fat. It's mostly fat like in olive oil. And you would all probably agree that olive oil is healthy, yeah? So most of the fat in red meat is actually like olive oil. Only some of it is saturated. So again, these are the myths. Foods don't just come as one ingredient. Uh, and when we talk about fats, in every fatty food... All the fats occur, monounsaturated fats, polyunsaturated fats, and saturated fats in different ratios. They're all there. There's no such thing as a one-fat food. Okay? So these are the healthy fats. Animal fats, olive oil, avocado, these are the monounsaturated predominant fats. Chicken livers, fatty fish with all their omega-3s, nuts, coconut and coconut products. These are what our children should be eating, as should we. That's where most of our energy should be coming from. And why should children be eating fat from a young age? 
Because there's this organ in the human body which is very important when they go to Hartman House to be educated by Mr. Calderwood's team. And I didn't welcome Mr. and Mrs. Calderwood because they're spearheading an initiative at Hartman to try and keep those kids nutritionally healthy. This thing called a brain, do you, do you think it's made of sugar? Do you think it's made of protein? Shall I tell you what it's made of? It's made of fat. The human brain is 60 to 70% fat. It contains 25% of the body's cholesterol. So if we don't feed young children and babies fat, that's why, that's why breast milk has got fat in it, because the organ that requires the most amount of fat for early development is the brain. And there are good studies to show that if children are not exposed to adequate intakes of saturated fat and omega-3 fatty acids, their brains do not develop to their full potential. So low-fat, high-carbohydrate nutrition for developing children is a disaster. When you just look at brain development alone, let alone the rest of their metabolic health. A few words about protein. So when we talk about a low-carbohydrate, higher healthy fat nutrition program, we talk about a moderate protein intake that comes along for the ride because many of the food sources of healthy fat are also protein sources like dairy and meat. One of the myths about low-carbohydrate nutrition is that we're advocating a high-protein diet. And the honest truth is, if we're talking within the terms of reference that I defined in low-carbohydrate nutrition, we are not talking about a high-protein diet at all. We are talking about figures of protein intake that are moderate and very healthy and there is no risk to your kidneys and provide the growing child with all the protein they need to grow, for their bones to grow, for their muscles to grow, and their tissues to grow. Remember that the only complete proteins, what is a complete protein? It's a food source that contains all nine essential amino acids that we have to get from our diet because we cannot manufacture them. The only complete proteins are animal proteins. There is no vegetarian or plant food complete protein. They all have bits and pieces, but no single plant food contains all the essential amino acids. So vegetarians have to be clever about mixing their sources of plant food to get all the amino acids they need to have the right protein they need in their bodies. Kids need complete protein and lots of it. They get it from animal foods. And we basically don't go around measuring food. If you look at most humans, their palm diameter and their palm thickness pretty much tell you that that's the right amount of protein on a plate. Okay, so how big should the steak be? Palm size. Okay, it's a good idea. Not eat the whole chicken. All right, so we're not advocating a high-protein diet at all. So vitamin minerals are interesting. I made the comment that they're very important, and the more colors of the rainbow there are in a child's diet, the better, because all the different colors have different uh, micronutrients in them. But the main reason that we want uh, youngsters to eat a healthy, balanced diet Vet, uh, vegetable and fruit intake is fiber. The reality is that the best sources of most of the vitamins and minerals that we require from our diet come from animal foods. Of the 13 essential vitamins for human development and survival, 11 of them are found in animal foods. The one that we don't get a lot of from animal foods is vitamin C, unless you are an Inuit. What is an Inuit? An Inuit is the politically correct term for what we used to call the Eskimo populations of the Arctic North. Inuits don't grow fruit and vegetables in the frozen ice. They get their vitamin C from whale skin. We, were, we wondered for years how they were never vitamin C deficient because they ate no, 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 none of these veggies and fruits. And then we found out that actually whale skin's got a high concentration of vitamin C in it. So it's interesting. So we don't need this because of this. We need to get animal foods into our children. So there's very little evidence to support a requirement for mountains of fruits and vegetables because we believe that's where they're going to get all their vitamins and minerals from. They're going to get them from animal products. 
And in fact, liver is one of the healthiest resources of vitamins and minerals and healthy fat that you can actually eat. So if you can get your kids to eat liver, it's an unbelievably nutritious food. We call it a superfood, along with eggs uh, and animal meat and avocados. We call those superfoods. So to tail off, to make the point that eating real food is very important, returning to unprocessed food is very important, but it's not without its delights. So that's what I'm saying. That chocolate cake, interestingly, is made totally of low-carbohydrate ingredients. Made from almond flour, sweetened with xylitol, the icing made from, from um, cocoa and butter. It looks nice, and I promise you, it tastes nice. My daughter makes those regularly, and they're fantastic. I just want to make the point that from a medical perspective, and specifically with respect to children, we are seeing, and the evidence shows very clearly, that there are distinct medical benefits by using low-carbohydrate nutrition to treat certain conditions. I'm not saying that these are the cure, the be-all and end-all, but have substantial uh, benefits when we use it in these conditions. The treatment of obesity, metabolic syndrome, which is pre-diabetes, very high blood sugars, high levels of insulin resistance, but not quite diabetic. Then diabetes type 2. Diabetes type 2 effectively is the end of the road for someone with severe insulin resistance. They start off carbohydrate intolerant, they get high insulin levels, they become pre-diabetic with metabolic syndrome, and then a large proportion of them will develop diabetes. We are using that very low carbohydrate nutrition to pretty much reverse diabetes. Hypertension responds very well to low carbohydrate nutrition. Cancer slows. We're not saying it's a cure, but it slows very much if you restrict carbohydrates, and kids also get cancer, sadly. Childhood epilepsy, very low carbohydrate nutrition, carbohydrate restriction down to low levels, is used as the treatment. It makes as much difference as anti-epileptic drugs without side effects. Okay, and before we had anti-epileptic drugs, we used carbohydrate-restricted diets in the 40s and 50s to treat epilepsy. Then we had drugs and we forgot about it. Now we're going back to it. Polycystic ovary syndrome affects uh, young girls and young adult females as a common cause of infertility, responds very well to low-carbohydrate nutrition. Acne responds. Celiac disease, which is a, an allergy, a severe allergy to gluten, ADHD, I mentioned earlier, it does respond to low-carbohydrate nutrition in probably about 7 in 10 children, as does autism, migraines, and the condition you're going to read more and more about, which is non-celiac gluten disorder, we now recognize a host of medical problems that are related to the intake of wheat. And this is rapidly assimilating in the literature. It's, it's been put under this acronym non-celiac gluten disorder, and you'll read more and more about that. We know that probably a lot of autoimmune diseases are a direct result of wheat intake and their effect on the bowel, allowing nasty proteins to escape from the bowel into the body. Anyway, that's a whole lecture on its own. So eating low-carbohydrate nutrition is what we are advocating for healthy children. Go and look for resources and information. So to share with you resources that I highly recommend, Cookery books about low carb. This is one written by a South African lady. It's brilliant. Low carb living for families. Also written by a South African lady. Brilliant. Ditch the Carbs is a website. Ditchthecarbs.com. It has got infinite recipes on it for everything and anything. If you need to explore the world of how to feed children the low carb way. My book's coming out very soon. It's called The Low Carb Companion, so we'll let you know when it's out. It's a very good summary and up-to-date review of the science, and it's got about 200 pages of recipes in it as well. This is Tim Noakes' second book with his team. The first book was called The Real Meal Revolution. The second book is called Raising Superheroes, specifically about how to feed kids healthily the low-carb way. And, and John, if you can ever get this book in for Hartman House children and parents, uh, sorry, this film for them to watch, it's called the, That Sugar Film. I watched it in South Africa. It is a brilliant educational module uh, that highlights everything that I have addressed uh, this evening. Um, it's a brilliant film. We're showing at Cinema Nouveau in, uh, in Gateway when we were in South Africa last year. 
But I think I, between us, we must try and get this movie up and get people to watch because it really, it's very funny. It's very well done. Uh, this gentleman, Damien Gatto, basically put himself on a diet without eating any sugar or refined carbohydrates that actually quantified to 40 teaspoons of sugar a day. And he was tracked by a, a, a specialist physician, a dietitian, and a pathologist who checked his bloods for three months. And the results were startling. And he builds into the story a lot of the health implications of high-carbohydrate diets that I've talked about tonight. So, yeah, I think as we go forward in the future, we're going to consider sugar and refined carbohydrates as weapons of mass destruction, which would probably have necessitated George Bush invading the country. However, that's where we're going to go if we haven't got there already, and we need to act in a positive way to ensure our children are healthy. So thank you for listening. Enjoy your dinner. I think there are some snacks coming if they're not already there. Some low-carbohydrate snacks provided by Cirillas that you're most welcome to chomp on your way out. I hope that was interesting. Happy to take some questions. Okay.